We're going to go ahead and move on uh, with the next speaker, who's Dr. Tom Jones. And uh, Dr. Jones is a research geneticist with USDA ARS Forest and Range Research Lab here in Logan. Um, he's uh, been developing plant materials for use in restoration projects since 1986, emphasizing cool season uh, native grasses for intermountain rangelands. He works in land, with land management agencies, the seed industry, and seed certification agencies to deliver the products. He hosts the Intermountain Native Plant Summit that's held in uh, periodically in Boise, Idaho. And um, he serves as an adjunct associate professor of wildland resources here at Utah State University. Help me welcome Dr. Jim. I want to thank the uh, Department of Wildland Resources for the invitation. Um, as Frank mentioned, I'm located at a federal lab and ARS lab here on campus. We have several partners we work with, many of which have already been mentioned today. I just want to give them credit for um, supporting our research. Um, there are several native plant materials issues that we deal with. And I'll list a few here. One that's already been mentioned is, this morning is ecological adaptation. But I want to emphasize when we're developing plant materials, this is one of several considerations we must make. Um, one that's very important is that of market. This year, 2007, being a big burn year, there's a tremendous demand for seed. But that demand is not consistent from year to year. And as you can imagine, being on the other end of the uh, of the uh, industry and the seed production sector, that creates a lot of problems in, in terms of managing a business. Um, there are issues we need to deal with on these species in terms of seed production and handling. Seed production systems have to be developed. Um, we have to develop a seed that both, there will be both demand for and is profitable to produce on an ongoing basis. Um, is uh, geneticist, uh, plant material developers work interested in the genetic identity of the, ma of the materials. And this entails the discipline of phylogeography, which is the distribution of genetic variation across geographic space. Also, an, an issue that was uh, mentioned earlier, I believe, by Val Joe, is that of genetic manipulation. In order to develop materials that are actually effective on the land, sometimes we have to resort to genetically modifying materials. Now, I'm not talking about uh, uh, inserting um, space aliens or anything like that, but, but some of the species uh, uh, that have been used, for example, crested wheatgrass, we do refer to as, as aliens. And, and we do, from time to time, practice selection or hybridization in, in order to develop better performing plant materials. I try to explain this using the restoration gene pool concept, and you may have already uh, picked up some of the handouts outside the door uh, behind you um, to my right. If you haven't, there's still some there I'd encourage you to pick up. This is simply a scheme I developed to help restoration practitioners make wise choices for plant materials. I don't pretend to want to make decisions for restoration practitioners or land managers. I think that would be rather presumptuous on my part. However, what I do hope to do is provide these folks options that help, can help them make these decisions wisely. It can also help them justify their decisions to their superiors so they can feel confident they've made the best possible uh, decision with the resources and circumstances, the cards uh, which they were dealt, as I mentioned this morning. So there are a series of four options, each called a restoration gene pool, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Now, for some of the uninitiated, um, the question might be, well, why do we produce, uh, why do we have this seed production, these seed production issues at all? This sounds like agriculture. This isn't, this isn't what I'm used to in terms of natural resources. Why don't we just local, use local material? And indeed, many have uh, championed the collection of local material, um, producing that seed off-site with, with the idea of bringing it back to those original lands in, the, in those local areas. However, can you imagine what would, have hap what would happen in 2007 if we had planned to do that? No one could for forecast the, the uh, extent and the veracity excuse me, it's the wrong word, not veracity, the, uh, 
not virtuosity. There's another V word. <laughs> um, vociferous. Vociferous <laughs> fires that we had this year. And in other words, using the primary rest- restoration gene pool requires quite a bit of advanced planning. As you can imagine, it's also going to be much more expensive than buying seed off the shelf. So this can be a viable option, but in particular circumstances, uh, it won't always work for the practitioner. In such a case, the practitioner may resort to the secondary restoration gene pool. In fact, this is what is most often used for native plant species. This is distant material of the same taxon. So for example, if I had blue bunch wheatgrass in my, in my seeding list, uh, I might in fact uh, use blue bunch wheatgrass, but it's not going to be from the particular burn site. It's, it's a commercial source, it's, um, but it is available. It is in seed production and it is available commercially. Um, sometimes, however, as you've already seen, the performance of these materials uh, isn't what we hope for. And Val Joe mentioned uh, specifically that he's not sure that we have the right plant materials yet. And that's certainly the case. As a plant materials developer, I'd certainly uh, agree with that. But I do want to uh, say something encouraging, and that is our plant materials in terms of their uh, performance and the diversity of plant materials is improving. And the money that's being spent in this arena is being put to good use. Um, but for the materials we have now, um, if those are problematic, you might fall down on, onto the tertiary restoration gene pool. This is actually a special case. When material is modified by a related taxon, to improve adaptation. And I'll give several examples of, of this uh, in the talk. Finally, um, if this uh, further step uh, distance removed from the local material is the quaternary restoration gene pool, an alien taxon with better adaptation to the modified environment than a local taxon. And we've already heard a couple of talks about how crested wheatgrass has u- been used to save cheatgrass um, um, save sites from total um, persistent domination by the invasive cheatgrass. So these are a series of options. It's up to the land manager to decide for each, each particular species in the seed mix which one is most appropriate in the current situation. Um, there's another publication uh, out, out on the handout table and that's uh, intended especially for practitioners to help them apply the restoration gene pool concept. And here's a decision support making tool uh, that's present in that publication. I also should mention that that, uh, Stan Young of the Utah Crop Improvement Association, who's present at this meeting, he has worked with the seed industry and seed certification officials to get a certification scheme developed and approved and is in practice um, by seed regulatory agencies. Notice here there are two columns. There's the manipulated track and the natural track. I mentioned, I alluded to this before, the natural track are materials that have not been intentionally selected or hybridized since they were collected from a native site. Whereas here there's been some genetic manipulation to try to quote unquote improve the materials for a particular application. And that particular application is important because the particular application it was developed for may not be your particular application. So you need to study up on these plant materials to make sure you're using them properly. I'll go through a series of species here. I've worked mostly with the grasses. We'll cover them first. Blue bunch wheatgrass, Pseudorugnaria spicata. The primary restoration gene pool, we're working with these uh, three populations for the Snake River Plain, the upper, the middle, and the lower, um, going from higher elevation to lower elevation, and with the intent that these materials will be used in those localities. The secondary restoration pool, these are materials that are commercially available off the shelf. And you can see um, the first release was Whitmar, which was followed by G- Goldar was followed by Anatone, and um, also one called P7, which doesn't have a star because it was developed from 25 different sites. 
you can see that uh, P7, as well as these other, originates in this area right here. So you might think, well, well, that's what makes it secondary, first of all, if you're talking about a restoration site in the Great Basin or Snake River Plain. You might ask, well, why does all the materials, do all the materials come from up there? Well, it's because it's been found the germplasm in that region, for whatever reason, is, um, has better performance um, than other material. And so, but there's, I want to assure you that there's ongoing work to develop primary restoration gene pool material for these areas as well, because there will be a demand for it. Um, a tertiary restoration gene pool, this is where I mentioned that um, where a, a, a related taxon is involved. Well, blue bunch wheatgrass happens to have two ploidy levels, diploid, which is much, much more common, and tetraploids, which are relatively infrequent. But what we can do is double the chromosome number to develop a seed that's 51% heavier. And we hope that this will help improve establishment of blue bunch wheatgrass. So this is just one technique uh, that can be used to help overcome some of the problems that have been de detailed in the previous talks. You may know about something about blue bunch wheatgrass in terms of its grazing tolerance. Well, it isn't. So, um, but you can see if you put out a nursery here, there's variation for this trait. Some plants have regrown from clipping, whereas others have not. So this is a trait we can select for. We can develop populations that have improved grazing tolerance and may be more tolerant of mismanagement. So again, I'm presenting this as one of several options. Snake River wheatgrass. This is a uh, native grass with a relatively limited uh, geographic distribution. It's found in the uh, upper, um, excuse me, the lower uh, Snake River drainage as well as the Columbia River drainage. It's functionally similar to blue bunch wheatgrass. It's a similar phenology and it's also bunch grass like blue bunch wheatgrass. Um, it isn't found in the Snake River Plain. It isn't found in the Great Basin but it has been widely used um, as a substitute for blue bunch wheatgrass in those uh, ecoregions. Um, so this is an example of a, a, a completely different taxon that's being used to replace blue bunch wheatgrass and this has occurred very successfully. Um, the, the one cultivar that's available is C-card and you see it originates up here at Lewiston, Idaho. Indian rice grass. Um, this was the first species I started to work on in 1986. Um, again, the materials here, the secondary restoration gene pool. The first release was Paloma, followed by Nespar, followed by Rimrock. And we've had a couple of, of releases in the Colorado Plateau, White River, and Star Lake. But as you can see, there have been no releases made from the uh, Great Basin. And the most um, the biggest reason for this is this material is highly, highly dormant. It's very, very difficult to get stands initially. Uh, again, I predict that at some point that problem will be overcome and we'll have either through genetic manipulation or, or through seed treatment, we're working on both areas, um, we'll be able to um, have materials uh, from the Great Basin to use in the Great Basin. Um, see, Indian rice grass is a species that has seed polymorphism. Within a single population, there may be multiple types of plants that produces, produce these various kinds of seeds. So these are genetically distinct plants that produce, produce um, seeds. In other words, um, it's like a Noah's Ark, Jumbo begets Jumbo, Globos begets Globos, and Elongate begets Elongate. I don't, I don't want you to think that all three are produced on the same plant. That's incorrect. What we found in genetic work and phylogeographic work is that these morphs from the same, when collected at the same site, and these were collected from a site in northwestern New Mexico, they are not closely genetic, genetically related. And as, as compared to two globose morphs, for example, from distant sites. So my interpretation of this is these are completely different genetic entities that have migrated from different points and have happened to end up at the same spot and we've come along and collected them. So this shows the kind of genetic variation you get in a single species at a single site. Squirrel tail. Um, the first species, Elemis multicetus, this is the picture here, big squirrel tail, as well as Elemis elamoides, bottlebrush squirrel tail. 
Um, this has been a um, people have been accused me of being a, a, a bit overboard in terms of squirrel tail. And uh, but these are some of the releases now. Uh, we released the first squirrel tail, a, a big squirrel tail stand hollow. Um, there have been other releases of these other releases are all bottle brush squirrel tail. There are three major subspecies. Uh, Brevifolius, Californicus, and subspecies Elamoides, and uh, you can uh, see where they're located here. So we're starting to get a pretty good geographic res representation for this group. While I have this picture up, I want to emphasize the groups of researchers that are doing this kind of work. First of all, there's the USDA NRCS Plant Material Centers, and they've been doing plant materials work for a long, long time, since the 1930s. Uh, basically since the, the founding of the Soil Erosion Service. And these are located in Aberdeen, Idaho. Uh, there's an affiliate, affiliate in Meeker, Colorado. There's one up in Bridger, Montana. Uh, Pullman, Washington. And then there's a new one in Fallon, Nevada. So these uh, centers do excellent work and I very much enjoy working with them. The second group is a joint group between the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and EFRAM and the Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station Shrub Sciences Lab in Provo. And uh, they're also very much involved in plant materials work. And people like Jason Vernon and Therese Meyer, uh, Scott Jensen and Nancy Shaw are involved in that group. And the third group would, would be our lab here. Here's some pictures. Um, this is his big squirrel tail, Sand Hollow from Western Idaho. And here are a couple of bottle brush squirrel tails. Tremendous variation, genetic variation in this group. Uh, this is our most recent release. This is intended as a primary restoration gene pool material for southwestern Idaho. Uh, this material was collected in the Mountain Home area. Basin Wild Rye, you're probably familiar with this uh, statuesque bunch grass. It also has two chromosome races, in this case tetraploid and octoploid, and they're represented by two cultivars on the market. You can see the octoploid area here, um, and most of the rest of the area is tetraploid, but we do have evidence there that the two races are, are, found, um, are found together in southern Idaho and northern Nevada. Again, we can double the chromosome number and get heavier seeds. And in this case, we've hybridized um, basin wild rye with a closely related taxon, Lamus triticoides, uh, to develop, um, develop some new, new materials. I don't want you to think this is weird or anything, whenever you find these two species together, which you often do, you'll always find hybrids. And so what we try to do is capitalize on things that we see in nature, whether it's selection, hybridization, etc. Um, the blue grasses, um, Poa secunda, we have two sandbird blue grasses here that are available. Again, we call this a secondary restoration gene pool, and unless you're your restoration project happened to be in these areas. And also what's known as big squirrel tail, uh, Sherman, or excuse me, big bluegrass, Sherman, um, which is a, a much taller type and later in maturity. In fact, you may be interested in knowing is that a lot of people consider sandbird bluegrass to be one of our best hopes for a native against cheatgrass, because in many ways it mimics its phenology. It's an extremely early grass and is done and senesces just like cheatgrass, but it is a perennial and continues to grow the following year. A couple other species uh, which are newer that aren't uh, commercially available yet. Needle and thread, this one's found on sandy sites. It has a lot of issues. I want to emphasize that some of these species are much easier to work with than others. And so we're, um, the plant materials community is extending its reach into a more difficult species that have been worked on in the past. So high indeterminacy and in seed shattering, this means it's difficult to harvest all that seed. Even though the species may be an inherently good seed producer, it's hard to capture it. Now, it was mentioned earlier the high price of native seed, but I want to assure you that plant materials work has helped greatly to reduce the cost of seed, sometimes dramatically, sometimes on the order from $35 a pound down to $6 a pound. 
And this is because we've overcome some of the seed production issues. Indian rice grass is an example, and bottle brush squirrel tail is an example. Other issues with this species are seed dormancy. This means it's difficult for the seed grower to get a stand. The on, the appendage on the seed, is difficult to remove, and it's difficult to get the seedlings uh, going in terms of their vigor. Thurber's needle grass is a lot of interest in this in western Idaho, northern Nevada, and eastern Oregon. There's some promising plant materials on the horizon from the Boise area and from eastern Oregon. Um, I've got several pictures of Forbes. I'm just starting to work with Forbes. These are in collaboration with my colleague Doug Johnson. Um, on these first two I'll mention, this is Western Prairie Clover, Dahlia ornata. Uh, and this one, Astragalus philippes, or basalt milk fetch. And Doug has identified uh, some promising materials from north central Oregon in the, in the John Day watershed. This particular species, the reason we're working on it, we were able to collaborate with the ARS Poisonous Plant Research Lab here in Logan to, to verify that this was in fact a non-toxic astragalus. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have moved ahead with this species. It has some very good seed production uh, capabilities, as you may see all the flowers and later the pods there. Everybody likes the penstemons, and uh, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. Um, the rest of these species I'm not working on personally, and Nancy Shaw in particular has provided some of the slides. Uh, this is Palmer penstemon. There's a cultivar called cedar. I can see the beard, the beard tongue mentioned right there. See a little bit of the beard there and there. Sagebrush penstemon. Firecracker penstemon. You see this a lot along highway seedings. Sand penstemon. Notice here the black plastic mulch. This is used to keep the weeds down to improve the seed production. This is a, a big problem. You know, it's difficult to find herbicides that can control broadleaf weeds in these broadleaf uh, seed crops. Globe mallow, Sprelsia species, uh, for example, Munroena, Glossariofolia, uh, Parvaflora. Western yarrow, this is the native forb that's been most widely and successfully used, uh, Achillea lamulosa. But as Bruce mentioned, there's, there's some introduced material on the market. He mentioned New Zealand. So if you want a true native material, make, make sure you get, if it doesn't have a white flower, it's not native. <laughs> so so uh, that, that, would, that could be kind of embarrassing. Um, here's a seed production field of this. You can see it looks very nice. Uh, there's another one right there. I'm not sure what the purple is. Uh, Lewis flax. This is an interesting one. Um, this is a native species. Uh, you can see the pale uh, blue color here. This is a material from the Shrub Lab and, and DWR called Maple Grove. But long before this material was available, there was another material on the market called APAR. Notice that the color is, is quite brighter here, but it was, it was found uh, at some point in time that this was in fact not the native species, but in fact an introduced congener, closely related species. It has similar ecosystem function. It happens to have much better seed production qualities than the maple grove, and so this will continue to be in the seed market. Um, so if you want the native, you need to specify maple grove and not apar. But, uh, but for those reasons, maple grove would be much more expensive than apar is. Taper tip hawksbeer. This one and the next one are important for sage grouse. They have that uh, milky latex sap, which attracts the insects, which are good for the uh, feeding of the birds. Uh, Crepus acuminata. And also, uh, in, the same, in the same regard, false dandelion. Agosaurus glauca, uh, both composites. Here we uh, have some of the biscuit roots. Uh, these forbs, this would be uh, nine leaf biscuit root, Lomatium triternatum, and fern leaf biscuit root, Lomatium dissectum. Uh, this again showing the seed production under the black plastic mulch. They, they use kind of a branding iron to, to burn the hole and then implant the, the seedling in the hole. This is Gray's uh, Biscuit Root. Again, a couple more pictures from wildland sites. 
lupins, uh, these are very colorful forbs. Um, up here we have the silvery lupin, a lupinus argentius, and here the silky lupin. If you use your imagination here, you can see that the hairs, why it's called silky lupin. Uh, buckwheats, um, origeron, excuse me, <laughs> areogonum umbellulatum. This is sulfur flower buckwheat. And down here, cushion buckwheat, Areogonum ovalifolium. Um, these forbs are more difficult to work with uh, than the grasses, but, uh, but a lot of effort's been put into them, and they, and they are going to become commercially available. They will be uh, fairly high priced, at least to begin with. Um, but uh, um, it's good to see that they're, they're, they're becoming available. Finally, I want to mention our icon for the sagebrush step, that is Artemisia tridentata. Um, unfortunately, I cannot report as good news for sagebrush and the other shrubs as I can for the grasses and the forbs. Um, one problem with sagebrush, it's, it's already been mentioned by Dave Pike in the other room that the wrong subspecies has been used. Um, but this diff seed is, um, this plant takes so long to mature and produce seed in a cultivated setting, it hasn't been economically viable to produce it in orchard situations under cultivation. So we are dependent on wild land seed supplies. And of course, this varies very much from year to year depending on weather conditions. Um, unfortunately, because of the, the long history of wildfires, much of the germplasm of basin, of a big sagebrush has been lost. Um, I do want to put a plug in for germplasm conservation. Our agency, the ARS, has a very pervasive uh, system called the National Plant Germplasm System, whose sole goal is to is to do uh, col curate collections and do research supporting those collections of of genetic diversity, including species, native species such as this. And so we need to get these kinds of materials into this system for posterity. So when we're able, we understand all the tools that have been talked about, the things that we don't understand. When we come to understand them, we will be able to have the germplasm we need to restore some of these sagebrush systems. Thank you very much. I don't think the seed is available. The research is being done on that species. Okay. And so the, the research I'm talking about is, is getting away. There may be some seed available from wildland seed harvest. What, we're try, what these folks are trying to do is to move it into a cultivated setting so the seed could be, more, be produced, number one, more economically, and number two, more dependably. So you can get it when you need it. The one thing about that particular species that we've tried to get is quite a bit, and I've been told that it really is not uh, commercially, uh, commercially, at this point, commercially viable species because um, the seed is uh, indeterminate, meaning that it uh, doesn't ripen all at the same time. Yeah, and those are the kind of problems that I alluded to in the talk. And, and so research is needed to try and overcome those issues if, if it is to become um, commercially available. So uh, what I'm saying is it has been deemed important enough to do that research. So hopefully uh, something will come of that research and it will be available. Likely it will be high priced for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, but, but these problems are being addressed. Um, can't be sure if it'll pan out, but. Okay. Thank you very much.